Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... This weekend, I decided to review a book that I recently read with my good friend Jennifer Hobson. And I really hate that she's not here to review this with me, but we're just playing it safe because COVID is still pretty bad. Now, as far as our buddy read is concerned, this came about because a few weeks ago, Jennifer had asked me to recommend a book that was similar to the movie The Nun. But unfortunately, I hadn't read any horror books regarding nuns, so I went out on a limb and suggested The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz. And as I was telling her about this book, I realized that the last time I read it was in high school, so I decided now would be the perfect opportunity to revisit this classic with her. And upon doing so, we had some really awesome discussions about the characters and the twist ending, and one of the things that I loved about doing this buddy read was... With Jennifer, she was trying to figure out from start to the grand reveal, like, just what was going on. And because of all of the possibilities that she threw out there and how deeply she got into the story, it reminded me of how I felt when I first read this. So it was pretty cool to be able to relive those emotions through someone else. But without me rambling on anymore, let's just go on and get down to what you can expect from this book. And Jennifer, if you're watching, just know that I had a great time doing the buddy read with you, and I hope you enjoy this video. Unfortunately, I don't have a print copy of this, but The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz is available in ebook and audiobook. Also, if you're lucky, you might be able to find a reasonably priced paperback on eBay. But anywho, The Sentinel is about a young model by the name of Allison who has recently moved into a brownstone apartment. And even though this gives her the independence that she's been craving, it does nothing for her anxiety, as she's still trying to cope with the death of her father, as well as her suicide attempts in the past. And now that she's developed these really horrible migraines, she's trying to focus on coming back to God after she had lost her religion. Then, to top it off, her asshole boyfriend Michael is always cross-examining her like she's on trial. So, yeah, she has a lot on her plate. However, the worst is yet to come, because after she becomes settled in her new apartment, she discovers that she has literally gained neighbors from hell. Then, as she spirals out into madness, she discovers that her every move has been orchestrated by other sources, which has landed her in a scenario where there is no escape. The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz was published in 1974, where it followed a supernatural theme that had already been established with horror novels like The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, and The Other. And like those titles, The Sentinel became a New York Times bestseller. In past interviews, Convitz said the idea of The Sentinel came to him one night when he couldn't sleep. Upon pondering the idea, he began writing, but suffered with plot and character development. Becoming frustrated, he decided to burn the novel in his apartment's incinerator, which, unbeknownst to him, had been replaced with a trash compactor. And because of this, the building superintendent found Convitz's manuscript and returned it to him, thinking that Convitz had thrown it away by mistake. From here, Convitz continued forward with his edits and pursued publishing. Fun facts! Here's a few things you might not know about Jeffrey Convitz. With The Sentinel being the first book published by Convitz, he would not publish another novel until years later when he released its sequel, The Guardian. In 2016, Convitz noted he would soon publish the third part to The Sentinel trilogy, and while a release was planned for 2017, it is yet to hit the shelves. As of now, I was unable to find any further information on why this book has been delayed. Aside from his novels, Convitz is a movie producer who has not only produced horror movies, but also drama and comedy. 
Among them, he wrote and produced the screen adaptation of The Sentinel, which Bravo listed in its top 100 scariest movie moments. Now that we have that out of the way, it's time to move on to the spoilers section, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you wish to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments and you'll see that I have a comment pinned at the top that has a timestamp in it. Once you click that timestamp, it will move you away from the spoiler section and bring you to the thoughts chapter. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone has had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few of my favorite moments, which the first WTF moment that comes to mind is when Allison discovers that, aside from herself and the elderly priest, there are no other tenants in the brownstone, which this means that with all of the neighbors who she recently met, none of them exist. And to prove that they don't exist, the real estate agent of this building takes Allison from apartment to apartment where she can see that these apartments are in fact vacant and they have been collecting dust. Now, when I first read this back in high school, I thought, okay, well, maybe Allison is crazy. Then I even thought that maybe her asshole boyfriend was in cahoots with other people and they were trying to scare her into moving in with him. And I had even at one point considered for them to be ghosts. But I really wasn't expecting what the grand reveal made them out to be. Now, I really feel like this scene is still very effective, and the reason why I say that is, with my friend who read this with me for the first time, she had no clue what to expect in regards to this twist. And she was like just kind of thrown back by this. She was like, I don't know what to think here, WTF, what's going on? So yeah, it's really awesome to see how this curveball is still effective with new readers. My next favorite moment is when Allison's dead father confronts her, which due to the backstory that we had received, we understand that he and her don't have the best relationship in the world, so when this comes about, we understand some shit is about to go down. But what happens here is Allison is laying in bed, and she hears someone pacing around in the apartment above her, which we earlier established that this apartment is vacant, so there should be no sounds coming from it whatsoever. And even though there's red flags left and right, Allison decides to grab her flashlight and a knife to go investigate. And when she gets into the apartment, her flashlight goes off on her, and she's like just kind of freaking out and stuff because she's in the dark. But then we discover that there's a dark figure in the room with her. And as it starts to approach, her flashlight comes on, and it's revealed that this figure is her dead father. And this is no heartfelt reunion whatsoever, because he's like covered in blue veins, his flesh is charred, and he has boils and pus on him, and he's, he's just pure nightmare fuel. But before Allison can escape, he grabs her by the hair and tries to rip off her cross necklace. And luckily enough, she has enough fight in her where she's able to stab him, then run like hell. Now, when I was a kid, this scene was very effective because even though I knew something was in the apartment, I didn't exactly know what to expect. And due to the pacing and the description, I really felt like this was an effective moment then, and it's still one that creeps me out to this day. As a matter of fact, it was this scene that had made it into Bravo's top 100 scariest movie moments, and movie-wise, I feel like this scene is just as shocking on film as what it was in the book. My final favorite moment is the grand reveal, which this is when Allison is confronted by Michael, who she doesn't realize is dead yet. But as they're talking, she discovers that the brownstone she's been living in is actually the gateway to hell. And to pay penance for her sins of attempting suicide in the past, she must now act as the new sentinel once the old sentinel, who is the old priest, passes away. 
From here, we discover that her neighbors, with the exception of the old priest, are all damned souls who have been attempting to drive her insane so she'll commit suicide. Which, if she commits suicide, there will be no new sentinel and the legions can have hell on earth. Now, this concept is pretty creepy to think that our fate lies in the hands of one person. Because, truth be it, Allison doesn't have to be the next sentinel. Like, she could commit suicide and join the legions of the damned. So, that's pretty unsettling to consider there. And also, I really enjoyed the visuals that were tied to this moment, because as Allison is receiving the cross from the old priest, you have all of the legions that just surround them. And even though the description really isn't too deep here, there's enough going on where it allowed my mind to fill in the blanks, and I really imagine these legions appearing the same as Allison's dead father. So yeah, my imagination was able to concoct some pretty ghastly images. I would like to use this opportunity to talk about tea and masturbation. Now, before you get too excited, I do understand that I'm visually stunning and everybody wants those fine details about my personal life. However, this is not about me. This is about the book, so you can just go right ahead and put your jellies back in the drawer. So, now that the air has been cleared, I would like to focus on the elephant in the room, which is the infamous lesbian neighbors, Sandra and Gerda. And what happens here is they invite Allison into their apartment for some tea, and while Gerda is in the kitchen making the tea, Allison and Sandra are sitting in the living room, and this is when Sandra decides to start beating the beaver before God and everybody else. And poor Allison is just sitting there like looking off into the distance trying to focus on God only knows what. And truth be it, if I were Allison, I would have at the very least given Sandra a round of applause because I have never been to a tea party before where the host sits there right in front of me and checks the undercarriage in their leotards. So yeah, definitely an entertaining party. They definitely deserve kudos. But on a serious note, I do have mixed emotions about this scene and the characters because a part of me thinks that maybe this is homophobic and a part of me thinks that maybe Gerda and Sandra are at the brownstone because they committed a crime like homicide or something like that. And if I were to weigh my options, the book would fit the mold of being homophobic because it was written in the 70s with a Catholic perspective and the author uses lesbian sex as a shocking trope. Plus, we understand that the brownstone is a haven for damned souls, and I kind of wonder if maybe the author is saying that Sandra and Gerda are here because of their sexuality. Plus, we have on top of that all of the derogatory names that they're being called throughout the book. So, yeah, if we were to look at it from this angle, there are some red flags that are screaming homophobia. But on the other hand, if Gerda and Sandra aren't stuck at the brownstone due to their sexuality, there's a possibility that they're trapped there because Gerda murdered Sandra's lover so they could be together. And I speculate this because Gerda explains to Allison at one point that when she met Sandra, Sandra had been with an abusive man. And considering how aggressive Gerda is, it makes sense that she would commit a crime of passion. And this is very similar to why Michael gets trapped at the brownstone, because it gets revealed that while he was married, he was cheating on his wife with Allison, and he murdered his wife to make it look like a suicide. And if this is similar to why Gerda and Sandra are at the brownstone, then they are not here because of their sexuality. Despite the author's reasoning for using these characters or how he might feel about them, I do believe that Gerda and Sandra are vital to the story. Which, I say this because they act as a trigger towards Allison, as we had earlier discovered that Allison had attempted suicide when she was younger because she had caught her father cheating on her mother with two women in a three-way. And at the end of the day, the spirits in the brownstone are trying to break Allison down so that she'll commit suicide where she won't be able to become the next sentinel. So, for the sake of hurtful memories towards the protagonists, it makes sense that one of the antagonists would emerge as a lesbian couple. 
And after rereading this, I did my research and couldn't find how the author felt about this subject one way or another. So if there's something that you know that I don't, please feel free to leave it in the comments. The Sentinel is a book that gave me mixed emotions, mostly because of the tropish and exploitative subject matter that I discussed in my Tea Time segment. Otherwise, this is a pretty original book that gives us a fresh look at the epic battle of good versus evil. And in particular, I thought it was fun how it referenced classics like Milton's Paradise Lost, as well as Dante's Inferno. But aside from that, The Sentinel is a book that provides us with some pretty heavy discussion topics, like lust, as well as losing and regaining your religion, and also the freedom to choose. Lust-wise, the Sentinel comments on how infidelity can damage relationships, which the first time I noticed the subject enter plot was when Allison discovered that her father was cheating on her mother and how this affected her. Plus, we also have how she reacted when she discovered that Michael was a cheater and she was in fact the other woman. Then neighboring those subjects, we have the hypersexual characters like Gerda and Sandra, which, depending on how you read in between the lines, they might be guilty of a crime of passion. Another subject that the Sentinel focuses on is losing and regaining your religion, which this is seen by how Allison walks away from God after her suicide attempt. Then throughout the book, Allison returns to God due to the chaos that's unfolding around her. And truth be it, I could relate to this subject, so it did hit home on a personal level, but even though the author didn't invest a lot of character development with Allison and the guilt that she might have felt due to these attempts, I totally understood the headspace that she was in. Now, in my personal opinion, I believe that the Sentinel's strongest comment regards how God gave human beings the freedom of choice. And without giving away any spoilers, this is seen by how Allison is faced with a life-changing decision at the climax of the story. And in all honesty, neither option she has to choose from is favorable, but regardless, she does have the option to accept or decline. Character-wise, the description was decent, and there were one or two characters who I could relate with. But unfortunately, none of them were fleshed out enough where I could become emotionally attached. And don't get me wrong, because each of the characters did have their own personality, it just feels like they were quickly developed to get us from point A to point B as soon as possible. And I really think that this was a missed opportunity for the author, because Allison had really been through a lot, and I wish we could have gained a little bit more insight into how she felt about her past and present situation, which, if that were to be, I might would have felt a little bit more connected to her, but that wasn't the case. Now, The Sentinel didn't scare me, but there were a few scenes that did creep me out, and overall, I think that the best asset that this book has to offer is it is really a great suspense book. And, I mean, it keeps you on the edge of your seat from beginning to end, wondering what's going to happen next or who you can trust. The Sentinel by Jeffrey Convitz feels like a pulp fiction novel that falls into the subgenre of spiritual horror. And if you're a fan of books like The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty or The Manitou by Graham Masterton, this classic could be your next go-to. And despite the dated dialogue and some of the tropes, The Sentinel really does a great job of keeping its readers engaged, and for this reason, I do recommend this book. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book you would recommend about a nun or a priest? Now, my second question is, how do you feel when you're reading a book and it presents an exploitative trope that is meant to be shock value? Personally, I feel like this is a cheap shot, and when I come across this, I just roll my eyes and keep on reading. But because of me being the curious person that I am, when I finish reading the book, I do my research, and depending on what the author says determines if I continue reading that author. But that's just me. And I would honestly love to see what your opinions are on that subject, which you can say whatever you like, just as long as you respect one another. So I'm really interested to see what you would have to say. 
Now that it's time to close out the video, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G, as well as J.L. Mulvihill, which J.L. Mulvihill is a young adult fantasy and steampunk author, and you can find her books available in print, ebook, and audio wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to say thank you to Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo is a fantasy author as well as a historic fiction author, and her books are available in print and ebook wherever books are sold. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they've had the opportunity to contribute to my Patreon account. And if you would like to contribute as well, I have a $5 tier that will give you a shout out at the end of my videos. And if you're a creator, I can tie what you create to your name so people can learn more about you. Also, I do have a $10 tier where you'll still receive the shout out at the end of my videos, but at the beginning of every month I'll send you over a photo, which I do creepy photography on the side. So once you receive this image, you can print it off and do whatever you like with it. And if you're unable to contribute, no sweat. All I hope is that you're able to come back to this channel so we can have a good time together. And if you would like to hunt me down on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this video. And if you haven't subscribed, be sure to subscribe and click that notifications bell because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until then, I hope you have a wonderful week and sweet nightmares.